My name is Regina Ashra Barrow. I'm the state senator for District 15 and happy to have served the citizens for the past four years. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, been married for 35 years and have lived in the North Baton Rouge community for nearly 30 years. Over the past four years, I'm very happy of the legislation I've been able to pass, including raising the age of children in the foster care system from 18 to 21. I also was very supportive and passed legislation to give teachers pay raises, the first pay raise they've had in a decade. I also was very instrumental with the Baton Rouge North Economic Development District, set it up, and finally got the funding to get, it, get, the, world, get the wheels moving with the Economic Development District. Now we have those individuals who are serving on that district who I look forward to actually bringing more economic development to the community. In addition to that, I was able to garner and bring home to my district over a million dollars. Part of that money will go to, part of that money will go to the airport, other part will go to Breck, and then a portion will also go to the Baker Zachary Sports Center. So we have been able to work really, really hard in the district. I'm a strong supporter of the veterans. I uh, have passed pieces of legislation that allow veterans who are in the National Guard to go back to school to get up to a doctorate degree on behalf of the state, <coughs> and as well as supporting children, and pre-K program as well as those individuals who are in our community. I am a strong supporter of our elderly as well, have been able to work with grandparents work, raising grandchildren as I am a grandparent raising a grandchild. So I am your state senator. I have enjoyed serving this district for the past uh, four years and look forward to doing it for another four years. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Gary Chambers and a product of North Baton Rouge. A product of North Baton Rouge, um, born and raised in this community. Uh, Louisiana is ranked number 50 in the nation, number 49 in the economy, number 48 in education, number 45 in health care, number 43 in fiscal stability, number 50 in environmental quality, number 50 in crime. <coughs> We used to be able to say we were better than Mississippi, and now even Mississippi's doing better than us. To give off the appearance that we're doing a good job is just simply not true. I'm running because for the last five or six years, I've advocated in this community uh, for economic development, for health care access for the residents of North Baton Rouge, uh, for equity in contracts within this community, because when I looked around my community, and the people I had voted for, I hadn't seen enough change happen in my community. And so for me, uh, this is about taking us from dead last and improving where our standings are in the country. Uh, when you look at North Baton Rouge, I challenge anybody to drive Senate District 15, from Zachary to Baker to Brownsville, Alson, Scotlandville, Glen Oaks, all the way to Boulevard to Province, and tell me where the development is. Tell me where the opportunities are. And when we have the condition of a community where it is, we cannot continue to do the same thing. Uh, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. And so I'm running because I've recognized that there's only so much you can do from the outside. There's only so much advocating can do. You've got to get to the table and be the decision maker and the advocator in chief as a, an elected officer uh, to make the change in our community. Uh, my platform is Do Good and Seek Justice, and I look forward to the opportunity uh, to continue the conversation. Thank you both. Our uh, timekeeper is Bill Bryan, so we want to thank him as well. Uh, the first question, the moderator gets to ask the first question, and the first question is regarding economic development in North Baton Rouge. I know that both of you have worked in that area. What is the one thing that you think needs to be done to continue to move that forward? And we'll start with Gary. <clears throat> So I think that when we look at economic development in North Baton Rouge, there's been a lack uh, consistently for the last 15 years. Uh, we've lost grocery stores, hospitals, and small businesses, as well as large businesses. For me, the solution is not to wait for business to come, but to go and get it. 
Uh, I'm going to be an active senator that gets on a plane and goes to the markets that have uh, big jobs and says, hey, look, these are the incentives that we can bring to our district. In Senate District 15, there isn't a single TIF, not a single tax incremental finance project in the entire district. When you look at economic development and how we lure businesses in, you've got to use the legislation and the resources at your disposal as a legislator to attract businesses. That'll be my mission and my mindset. I won't wait for business to come. I'm going to get them. I believe that the components to begin economic development in North Baton Rouge are already in play. The Baton Rouge North Economic Development District is one component already in place and finally it has garnered some financing where they can actually leverage additional finance to begin to go out and attract businesses, but not only attract businesses, but assist the businesses that are already there and help them to grow and become stronger. In addition, we now have the opportunity zones. So I plan to uh, to go forth and begin to look at how we can use and build with the opportunity zone that are in North Baton Rouge, use that platform, bring additional uh, investors to the table, and really put a plan together that the community has bought into and has said what they would like to see done in the area. So I believe that we are already on the way. Thank you. Now we'll open up, up for questions. Please identify yourself before you ask your question. Uh, Lanny Keller, the advocate. Uh, uh, two of the leading candidates for governor have said that they would roll back the uh, uh, sales tax uh, increase, which uh, is responsible for balancing the budget. Uh, but that, that uh, uh, how do you feel about that? It was still in the last session. And secondly, because, because that was via a sales tax, which is regressive <coughs> and probably has a disproportionate impact on households in, in your Senate district, uh, would you look at any alternatives? The question is, how do you feel about rolling back sales tax, and how do you feel about it in your district, or any alternatives to that in your district? And we'll start with the Senator Barrow. Thank you so much for the question. I can tell you in the beginning when we were looking at adding or increasing the sales tax, I was opposed to that initially because that is the most regressive form of taxation. However, when we were not able to, to come to a medium in terms of being able to uh, address our tax incentives and rebates, then we didn't want to cut services because that's the most important thing. I, I believe that we cannot afford to cut services to families. However, I introduced a piece of legislation two years ago that a report is going to come out in 2020 actually talking about the amount of tax rebates, incentives um, that we give away to companies and where they are going and looking at those to see whether or not we still need to actually grant those. And I believe that if we begin to address taxation, we need to look at how much money we are giving away. Thank you. So we can't roll the sales taxes away uh, because that, that is how we balance the budget. I think when you talk about our state, we're, we're not very open-minded about creating new revenue. Uh, one of the things I support is the legalization of cannabis in the state of Louisiana to generate new revenue for our state. That's something uh, that the current administration uh, senator does not support. For me, when you look at what we've done, we've continued to do the same thing. Uh, one of the first things I'm going to do when elected is call the 38 other members of the Senate uh, that are elected and begin to have those conversations before I'm elected because you don't wait till you get to the legislature to begin building relationships to make things change. Uh, you begin that process immediately. I also would challenge that when we talk about economic development or the, ac the economic development uh, board being in place. The reason it was needed is because we haven't had development over the last 15 years of leadership. Next question. Uh, Robert Kern, Sound Off, <coughs> excuse me, Sound Off, Louisiana. Last week, former Congressman Cleo Fields indicated that he would be supportive of a bill to eliminate the licensing requirement for hair braiding. Uh, can you give us uh, your take? You would be supportive of that uh, measure and any thoughts on any uh, recent bills to actually increase the number of hours that are required for hair braiding? The question is regarding licensing for hair braiding. Would you be in favor of removing, removing license. that license? Right. And we'll start with 
Gary. I would be 110% in favor of uh, removing that licensing. For me, I know too many uh, people within the community, that's how they feed their families. And that's something, as black people, we learn from our parents. You don't need to go to school to learn how to braid hair. Uh, your mama taught you when she was braiding your hair. And there are too many opportunities for people uh, to, to build businesses uh, through this process. And I don't think that we should be uh, doing it. it you, you, we put more stringency on people in cosmetology than our police departments, and that's shameful. The role of government is to protect, one of the roles of government is to protect its people. Certainly, I do support the measure of having licensure for many professions, and that profession is included. I do believe, however, that there are too many hours that are required. But when you are talking about braiding hair and also using chemicals, which many of them do, when people won't color their hair, I have seen the outcome of what happens when you have individuals who are unlicensed and are braiding and using color and then individuals actually can lose their hair. And I'm going to tell you, for a woman, one of the most important things about her is her hair. She want to make sure that she looks good. And I have seen too many women, women who have actually had their hair braided too tight. I've witnessed where uh, a baby actually ended up losing all the hair on her sides and actually having sores as a result of it. So yes, I do believe in licensure. Next question. Yes. Uh, recently, the universities other than LSU, uh, there would appear to be a, a, a program to recruit people who have been to college and have not finished. Uh, those colleges are each have their own standards to go back. Uh, LSU had a standard that after 10 years, you went back with no credits whatsoever. However, would you support a bill as a senator that would say students that have been out a period of time, three, four, five years, would be able to go back and lose the D's and F's so that they could go back effectively? Would that be something we would support? Would you support students who have been out of college for at least five years to go back and lose some of their poorer grades, D's and F's? And we'll start with Senator Barrow. Certainly, I believe in making sure that we give every opportunity available to our young people and even some of our more seasoned people to be able to go back and further their education. The devil is always in the details. And so with that question, I want to say on the onset, yes, that I would be in favor of assisting those individuals who are trying to come back and make a better life for themselves. But again, the devil is in the details. And I would have to say that I would need to see the language of that before I would firmly commit to that. But at the end of the day, I am committed to ensuring that we give opportunities to every individual who wants to go back and better, them li better their lives so that they can be a better citizen in our state. Thank you. Indy Iris said, I am not my hair, to the last uh, question. Uh, but to your question, sir, when we talk about people going back to get their education and further themselves and advance their families, I certainly would support legislation that allowed them to drop their negative grades. We need to do everything we can to get as many people as qualified as possible for the workforce. You can't rank last in opportunity, number 50 in opportunity, right, and say that we're going to limit people going back to school. If you want to pay for an education and get a, get a better job for your family, I 110% support that. Would either of you support a constitutional convention? And we'll start with Mr. Chambers. Uh, yes, I would support a constitutional convention. Uh, for me, you can't continue to have all of our all of the things that are dedicated, dedicated, and that's how we continue to uh, attack head education and health care because it's the only place we can cut. Now, as a, a Democrat, it's concerning. Let's be honest, because we are going to be in the minority, that is a fact, and sometimes people on the other side of the aisle attempt to slide things in, uh, so I would want to restrict that 
in some measure. I can't tell you the specifics at this moment, um, but I would want to make sure that we're clear in what our focus is uh, about restructuring the way this state is, is collecting its revenue because what we're doing is not working. To answer your question is yes. Actually, a few years ago, I actually sponsored a piece of legislation that would actually require us to open the Constitution. However, I would restrict in terms of what items would I possibly would restrict what would possibly be in that call. Uh, but we certainly have to look at our Constitution. And I, we've been, myself and one of my colleagues have been saying that for a very long time. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Dr. Dantzler, a gubernatorial candidate, has been quite critical of the mainstream media, basically stating that he is convinced they have attempted to quash the very existence of his campaign for governor. Could you all weigh in as to whether or not you think that uh, the treatment in general of lower tiered candidates, and especially his specific instance, I could just weigh in with your thoughts on that matter? Do you think the mainstream media has been fair to all candidates in the governor's race? The question is, do you think the mainstream media has been fair to all candidates in the governor's race? And we'll start with Regina. Somehow I'm thinking I might just need to just keep standing up. <laughs> Um, certainly, that, that is a question that comes up quite often. As a matter of fact, I can think about a couple of years ago in a gubernatorial election, uh, actually probably every time there have been a gubernatorial election, uh, those individuals who may be in that lower tier uh, say that they don't feel that it's fair. And it, it is to some degree uh, not fair because everybody may not know who they are and if they're not featured in the mainstream media, they may never get a chance to, to see them. But Overall, I do think and I, have, I do appreciate what the mainstream media is doing and have been doing across the board, but this seems to be an issue every time there's an election when individuals are not in that top tier, and maybe we need to figure out a better way of ensuring that everybody is at the table. Thank you. As a member of the media um, and a candidate at this point, I can tell you that I definitely believe that the media can be biased towards top tier candidates. Um, I'm not even really familiar with your candidate that you're speaking of, and that's an indicator, right? Uh, because we give the spotlight to the people with the most money and the people that we think are the most electable, and oftentimes that means some of the best ideas are not at the table. Um, I think that some of the requirements that we have to even have a debate in the beginning. I think if you're running for office, you should have to debate everybody that's on the ticket that's running against you uh, for a fair conversation. Now, after a certain point, I do believe that you have to wean out uh, people that are not going to make the mark. But I think any time we decide out the gate that these three or four people are the only people that we're going to even show to the general public, I think that's problematic because we stifle ideas from being at the table. Next question. Yes. Um, Gary rattled off several statistics where Louisiana ranks low in education and crime and things like that. Um, as a state senator, just to pick education, I think Gary said that we're ranked 48th in the nation. What can a single state senator do to try to improve that ranking, strictly in education, just for example? The question is, what can you do to improve education? And we'll start with Gary. Well, specifically, one of the things that we've got to do is be advocates for our local children. Um, one of the things that you've seen me consistently do is go to the local school board and advocate on behalf of that. One of the things that I would do as senator is set up a quarterly meeting with whoever the superintendent is uh, in the districts that are in my district because I don't want to wait until just it's time to go to session to do the work of the people. The work of the people is to be done every single day. Uh, and if you wait until the end of a school year or the end of a superintendent's term, you've allowed so many children to go through a process of failure without keeping your hand on the pulse of what's happening in your local school district. When you look at Senate District 15, uh, there are a host of failing D or F schools within our district. I think better communication about the resources needed uh, and how we can get creative about attracting those resources because everything that you do does not have to happen through the legislature though that is the primary function of a senator. Next question. Yes. Um, 
many of the issues that I believe that we see with education actually starts uh, uh, with our Bessie board. And Bessie is actually the arm that actually control many of the policies that are set and put into place that the school system, school boards must actually live by um, have to apply. So one of the things that have continued to happen, which I believe is a big issue and a big problem, is that the standards keep moving. So every time the children and the schools get to what systems or what uh, standard has been put into place, then it moves again. So then it automatically makes those schools become failing schools. And that's one of the things that needs to be addressed. We need to start with the Bessie school system and begin to address those policies that they are sending down to our school boards. Thank you. Would you favor the removal of the Board of Education, uh, Bessie Board? I don't know if I would favor actually complete elimination, but I, I certainly believe that that's the, it needs to be a total reconstruction. And, and so we have that opportunity to do that now. We have the elections coming up for those Bessie Board members who would then decide who's going to be the superintendent. And I believe that's what we need to begin to address and look at. And we cannot continue to teach the way we used to. Our children are more technologically savvy, and we need to make sure that we are providing the programs that actually reach the children at that stage. And that's what we've not been doing. And so this is how we can change it. I don't know if I uh, totally believe that we need to completely remove them. Not at this point, but we certainly need to change who, who serves there. Thank you. Yeah, I support the, the abolishment of the Bessie Board, and I'll tell you why. There's so much money in the Bessie politics, it's ridiculous. Uh, Lane Grigsby, one person to name off. Lane Grigsby spent nearly a million dollars against Carolyn Hill uh, when she was running for the Bessie Board. No one person should have that much influence on our education system. Uh, when you put it back in the hands of the legislature, you have the opportunity for a more balanced approach to dealing with this issue. Um, and he's just one person that's invested in Bessie. And why do people invest in Bessie? because there's so much money in education. And so we can say it's a purest thing about educating the poorest and the least of these, but if that was the case, we'd have fired John White a long time ago and got somebody in place that could do something to help our children progress. Yes. Hmm. Uh, this is another education okay. question. Um, LSU, Louisiana is a poor state. Other states have more income and more access to education. Other states now limit who gets into their university, <coughs> Texas A&M, Texas, et cetera. LSU just five years ago, they took a picture of five people, one out of five was from out of state. Today, one out of four is from out of state. It's easy for administration to pick better educators or better income from out of state. Would you support a resolution to limit so that LSU does not continue to uh, expand its education for people out of state and educate our students? But you support a resolution to recruit more in-state students. And we'll I don't ever want to get in the business of stopping new talent from coming to our state. That's just not uh, something I support, whether that's a professor or a student. Uh, when you look at the places that we always say we want to be like, if we want to be like Texas, if we want to be like Austin and all of these other great cities, they're welcoming people into their borders, not determining that they don't want more people into their, their communities. You look at the cities that have the strongest economies, they're attracting the youngest, brightest talent from everywhere in America. And if you're young and you want to come to Louisiana State University or Southern University or any school in this city, I want you to come. I want you to get the best quality education. I want the best educators educating you. But the, the deal is we've got to better prepare our children in this state to be able to get into college, which we're doing a terrible job statewide with educating our children. We've got to focus on the root cause, not the symptoms. I am a strong proponent of education, and I believe that everybody should have the opportunity to be educated. I do not, I don't think I would support legislation or a resolution that would actually uh, put a limit on how many students can come here from out of state because what I have found is oftentimes when people come from different places they stay 
They don't go back to where they came from. And I can tell you here in Louisiana, without great food, a lot of people don't want to leave. But I, I believe that we need to create a better pipeline for our children, not only educationally, but also financially, so we make it easier. And when they go to school and finish, they are not leaving with a huge debt. I believe that's what we need to be doing. Thank you. probably know Medicaid is a big subject in the last two sessions and there's allegedly or apparently maybe some people that had higher income than they were supposed to have to receive Medicaid. What are your plans to address this situation and or do you expect legislation to clarify this? What are your plans to address Medicaid abuse? And we'll start with Senator Barrow. Thank you for the question, Mr. Hightower, and I believe that we are already doing that in the state. Uh, the mere fact that they have put in more system, more technological, technical, technical systems that are easy to catch individuals who may be trying to commit fraud is one thing that's already been put in place. We've upgraded our technology system to be able to catch those individuals. So now quarterly, individuals income is being reported and that's how those individuals were actually caught so I think that we are already ahead of the game I know this is something that the governor is committed to as well as the secretary of LDH to ensure that the people that need the services receive it because we don't need people who do not need services actually taking advantage of the system so I think we're well on our way and I know that the Attorney General is doing a good job of prosecuting those who actually fall into that category thank you So if you're catching them, you caught them, right? That's, that's the, the nuts and bolts of it. If you're catching the people who commit fraud, then the system is working. But the question is, why are people committing fraud? Why are people frauding the system to get the health care? Because they can't afford it. Even if we start talking about people having a little more than what is the requirement uh, as far as the income or you don't make this, the reason someone is frauding the system is because they don't make enough money to take care of their children, their expenses, and their health care. And nobody in our state should go bankrupt or lose their home or any of that fact because they can't provide afford health care. And so we've got to look at what are we doing to expand health care in this state. Uh, I support universal health care. Uh, and I believe that when we look at the ultimate picture of America, if people are losing their homes and their assets and their ability to provide for their families because of health care, we've got to do something to deal with the health care system. When people, when profits are ahead of what we're doing to care for patients, that's a problem. Can you weigh in on um, conservation rights, land rights, and things that are important to outdoorsmen? And we'll start with Gary. I think we've got to do whatever we can to protect our environment to make sure that people uh, can still feed their families off of the the land per se, right? And, and that's a, a aspect of the outdoors and whether it's fishery or uh, other or hunting, right? I, I also, you talked about gun rights. I believe that anybody should have the ability to own a weapon. Now what type of weapons and, and what you use those weapons for are a concern. I think we need universal background checks for people uh, that own weapons. I think it's too easy to get a gun. Uh, depending on what community you live in, it's a different outcome. For kids who live in uh, more 
conservative communities. You may have a, the threat of somebody walking in and shooting uh, 50 kids at one, one time because they're upset. In an urban community, uh, you may have a young person that got a gun too early and someone else lost their life as a result of it. So when we talk about guns, I do think we need to have an open conversation, understanding that this is sportsman's paradise, but if it's a paradise, all our children should be able to live in it. Certainly this is uh, the sportman's paradise and I have come to respect many of those individuals who have come to the legislature who have shared their concerns about some of the things that were encroaching upon their rights to be able to have the freedoms and be able to enjoy the paradise that we have here. I believe that we have to be very careful about that. I believe that when you have individuals who are not from Louisiana who wants to come and participate in the sportsman's paradise that we need to make sure that the laws are not too restrictive where they can't have fun but at the same time reserve the rights for those individuals who actually own that land and own that property. Uh, conservation is very important to me. I know that we've done a lot. Uh, we have a, a lot of money that are coming down, billions of dollars to actually rebuild our coast, and I think that's extremely important. And I do believe in sensible gun control, but I do believe that everybody has the right to have the proper weapons, and I believe that background checks are very important. But at the, at the end of the day, this is Sportsman's Paradise, and I do believe that we should have able to have the right type of guns. Thank you. Uh, my next question is about uh, uh, legalization of marijuana for recreational use. I know, Gary, you mentioned that you're in favor of it. I'd like you to expand upon it. And Senator Barrow, would you support it? Currently, I do not support the legalization of recreational marijuana. I do support um, medical marijuana. And I have heard about the uses uh, in terms of individuals who have been able to use the uh, medical marijuana, but I do not support recreational marijuana. There are too many um, things that we don't know have not been able to work out, especially as it relates to safety for those individuals who are working. How would those policies apply? Uh, what would actually come into play? And to me, there are too many unanswered questions to be able to say yes to that. I fully support the legalization of marijuana um, and if Colorado is allowing uh, middle-aged white men to start businesses and make millions of dollars off pot, uh, then the state of Louisiana needs to wake up and legalize marijuana so that the people in this community can create some new revenue. That's number one. Number two, uh, the senator talked about supporting uh, for, from a, for health care use. She actually voted against it and then voted for it after there was public pressure. Um, when you talk about dealing with opening opportunities for people, anything that brings a new industry in, if it's working for Michigan, it's going to work for Michigan, if it works for Colorado, if it works in D.C., if it's working in eight or nine other states and 36, 34 other states have legalized some form of marijuana, why do we always have to wait in the South to be last for everything? We've got a shot to be uh, the pot capital of the South. We've got New Orleans. People are going to come to New Orleans and do tourism. Let's bring that new revenue into our state and open up the floodgates to give us more revenue because we don't have it. And it's just a restrict. It's just not a gateway drug. It is not. It's a myth and a lie. We'll now give each candidate a chance to ask the other candidate que a question, and we'll start with Mr. Chambers. Uh, my question to Senator Barrow would be, uh, I grew up in North Baton Rouge and um, a few weeks ago I made a video and it showed uh, Earl K. Long Hospital, the grass was growing up uh, almost to my head. And so I made a video outside of the, the property. Uh, Senator, you live about two or three streets away from that property and drove past it on a regular basis and after posting it on social media, the grass got cut. And to me, that's an example of the conditions of our community. Will you accept responsibility for the condition of the community you've represented for the last 15 years? Mr. Chambers, when I took that oath of office, I accepted responsibility for the district. 
and then accepting responsibility and then responding to the needs of the district as they come forth. Now what he doesn't know is that I have been meeting with the Baton Rouge Housing Authority because they have, when the legislation was written, it was written to ensure that no any in business could come there and put up anything in that community and we not know what it would be it did not be an asset to the community. So it was given to the East Baton Rouge Housing Authority and we have been meeting to look at the plans that was put together under former State Representative Ronnie Edwards and Mayor Broom, the charrette, to lay out what are going to be the anchors for that community to begin to put different initiatives that would be an asset to that community. I have always been responsible, being responsive to my community and will always be responsible and responsive. Mr. Chambers, you currently serves on the, you serve on the Baton Rouge North Economic Development District. Have been on there for three years. For the first year or so, I was told that you rarely showed up for meetings. But you had the opportunity to actually talk about some of the economic development that you were going to bring to the district and do for the district. You've had three years to do that, yet there's been very little movement and I have not seen any one plan that you brought to the table to actually improve or make a difference. What is it that you plan to do or what tangible plan did you have, do you have in place since you serve as a commissioner on the Baton Rouge North Economic Development District? So I'll tell you what I've done first. Uh, in 2015, 2016, uh, there was no emergency room in North Baton Rouge. Uh, I challenge every member of the press to look up the dates and times of who held the meetings to bring an ER to North Baton Rouge. I chat because you were there, you reported on it. I challenge you to look at the town hall meetings and who started the conversations about economic development in North Baton Rouge. Because Senator, I have voted for you repeatedly and my community was in decay. Over and over, I voted for the same people, and I watched business after business leave my community, and so I got fed up. The reason I didn't attend most of the meetings that year was because Rinaldi Jacobs was appointed the chair of the North Baton Rouge Economic Development District, someone the senator supported, who could not run the agency. So what I did was operated a coup, changed the chairman of the board, and changed the executive director, and we're now moving the district forward because the people who were put in place by the legislatures were not working for the district. The question is, is there a constitutional round, right to a 40 round clip? Senator Barrow. Can you explain it a little bit more? Well, the, most countries do not allow citizens to have fast, fast firing, large uh, chamber guns. They just don't. Uh, why, is, is there a constitutional right in the United States to have uh, a gun that can slaughter 40 people in a short space of time. Well, certainly, if there isn't the constitutional right, it certainly has been upheld as if it is a constitutional right. And I, I do believe that that type of weapon is not necessary uh, in our country. Individuals who hunt don't even use those type of weapons because it actually destroys the meat. So. I, I don't see the need for that, and every time there's been any mass shooting, every, every individual has had one of these massive guns with the 40 clips, uh, AKA, and all so forth and so on, and I don't think that it, those are necessary. Uh, when the Founding Fathers created the Second Amendment, I don't think they had 40 round clips or AK-47s or AR-15s in mind. They were talking about muskets and uh, Cannons, right? Uh, I think that we as a country have gotten gun crazy and believe you look at any time somebody talks at all about restricting gun rights, how f high the gun sales go up because people think, oh, they're going to take away our guns. 
I just do not believe that America will ever be a country where they strip people away of all of their weapons. But I do not believe my nine-year-old daughter is in East Baton Rouge Parish school system. My nine-year-old daughter should not have to go through drills about uh, somebody, an active shooter situation. There should not be, uh, I was in high school when Columbine happened, and I remember we went from wearing regular book sacks to clear book sacks. That should not be the norm for our children, and if we really say that we care about our children, we got to do something about this because it's ridiculous. Yes. My question is about the city of St. George. Uh, my question is about the city of St. George, if that would come to be. Is there anything you would do as a state senator if that happens? Uh, question is about the city of St. George. If that came to be, is there anything you would do if that happens, Gary? So I'm going to say something that, uh, you know, I'm going to just call it like I see it. I think the city of St. George is legalized segregation. That's what I think it is. When you make a city that's 80, 90 percent white, uh, break away from the rest of the parish, I think it's, I think it's pretty racist on its face. Um, furthermore, I think when you look at uh, where our community is, that portion of the parish has the best of everything. They have the best uh, roads, they have the, the most economic development, the most resources, and now that we've all paid into their system, they want to take their toys and go home. I cannot tell you specifically what, because that would be uh, unveiling plans that I think would be uh, unwise, but yes, there would be a recourse for me as senator if St. George were passed. Um, there are things within legislation and things through legal uh, action that can be done. I just think that when you talk about taking away that large of a swath of our community that has gotten the most in resources, um, their community's representation is actually the majority on the council and the school board. So it's that community's fault, the condition of the, com the Baton Rouge, more so than the people who are underrepresented in, in uh, elected officials in our community. So your question was, what would I do? First of all, I believe there are going to be a series of lawsuits uh, that's going to keep this issue tied up probably, I don't know how long, probably in courts. Uh, it's very unfortunate that everybody in the parish did not have an opportunity to vote on this since it's going to impact the entire parish. But I would say this, uh, going forward, I would immediately make sure that in terms of the rights of those individuals who are in EBR away from uh, St. George, I would make sure that there is fair and equity if best possible as they are beginning to separate the assets and the liabilities. And those, that's one of the things I would do immediately if it passes. Do you feel that Governor Edwards dropped the ball on Johnny Anderson, or do you feel like he's being unfairly attacked? And we'll start with Senator Barrow. That is a uh, loaded question, and I can tell you that there are a lot of details that are not exposed. Many of those uh, details I cannot, and I am not at liberty to express myself. I, I would say this, that is that people need to be very careful in terms of how they see things because things are not as they always appear. And so I, I believe that the governor acted as in, as in the best uh, possibility that he could under the circumstances with the information that he had. And so as it comes forth right now, um, people are probably making judgments and decisions based upon what they see, but everything is not as it appears. Thank you. I think whenever a woman alleges that someone uh, committed uh, some form of sexual assault against them or sexual harassment against them that uh, you have to take that extremely serious. I think that the governor took it serious and the governor removed Johnny Anderson uh, from his office. Now, whether or not he's guilty or not is the question 
that I'm not sure anyone can answer besides the people who were involved. And I think that when we use politics like this after the fact, I think this is the worst part of politics. Because if there was a consequence for the action and the person was removed from, from the position that they were in, then that settles it. Um, to continue to bring this up over and over again is simply a way to attack Governor Edwards because you really don't have anything else to attack him on. What changes would you make to Louisiana's tax system in collecting revenue? And we'll start with Gary. So one of the things that, and it's probably a little controversial to talk about, is homestead exemption. Um, a lot of states don't just don't do it, right? Um, and we're giving a pass to a lot of folks, and that's a lot of money on the table. Um, that we're not we're not looking at and I think we need to look at should we have a homestead exemption or not um, I think that yes we understand that people uh, who own property that uh, is less of less value but everybody should have to pay some level of taxes uh, on the property that they own uh, when you look at how we uh, do our business about creating new opportunities for revenue. Uh, the ITEP conversation was a big one in our state uh, in the last few months. When we exempt everybody from everything with no, no checks and balances to that, uh, we, we're in a very dangerous place. Um, and so I think that there's got to be mechanisms and ways that we check behind every incentive that we do to make sure that the taxpayers are getting the best for every dollar uh, that's brought into our state. As I stated earlier, uh, two years ago I did a piece of legislation that's going to take a look at the tax exemptions, tax credits, uh, tax rebates that we're offering in the state. Many of those have not been reviewed in over 50 years to see how many of those we still need to actually grant and perform. And I believe this is a, a, a great way to begin to look at restructuring our tax base as well as the Constitutional Convention. I believe that all of those factors are what's going to weigh into place in terms of how we actually restructure our tax base. And I believe that the conversation is so ripe that we're going to see movement at this time. I believe that everyone is having this conversation and everybody is ready to, for change. But I must say this, government is formed on taxation. That's how you actually run government. So we have to have some form of taxing. Thank you. Next question? Yes. Do you see any, uh, you see any attacks on the ITEP program as it's currently set up? And if so, what would you do to defend, if you're so inclined, the present situation? ITEP? ITEP. Okay. Uh, the question is about the ITEP program. That worked, okay. So currently the way the ITAP program is set up where it allows the local municipalities to actually decide what the exemptions they would like to provide, I think it's the best format. I, I am in favor uh, of that and I, I believe that that gives the local governance be, the opportunity to be able to look at whether or not they would like to grant those taxes and relinquish that that revenue that they would receive for different services in the community so i i i have no problem with that i was glad when the governor did the executive order for that i think to phrase it as an attack um, on ITEP is, is where I have an issue more than anything. The citizens of this state have the right to have a checks and balances to the incentives that are going out. So I think that if citizens want to see something different that they have a right to do so. I don't think that's an attack. But to answer your question, I do think it should be under local control, which it is now. And I believe that local citizens should be able to say whether or not any company gets the right to get a tax exemption in their community. Um, but more importantly, I think that when we put our state all into certain industries, and that's the only way we generate revenue, you're going to have issues. We have got to diversify our state's economy. 
if we're gonna if we're gonna be relying on oil and gas, we're gonna be in trouble in a few years. My daughter will be out of this state because this state will bottom up if we rely on oil and gas because the rest of the world is going green while we're stuck in the past. Thank you guys for answering the question. Now we will give you one minute for closing remarks and we'll start with Senator Barrow. Again, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak before you today. Experience matters. Being able to understand the process matters. Following procedures matters. I know how to do all of this. Just imagine this. If you had to have a procedure today and the doctor walking in, one of the doctors comes in and he's been uh, doing operations for 15 years and he tells you what the process is going to be and what you can expect. And then a younger doctor comes in who just graduated from school and tells you this is what we learned through technology. This is where we learn through this. Which doctor will you choose? Thank you. Regina Barrow, number 66 on your ballot. If the younger doctor had a better education from a more refined school to get there, I'd take the young doctor with, doctor with more technology. Uh, I'm Gary Chambers, and I'm a product of this community, born and raised in the streets of North Baton Rouge. When you look at the community the last 15 years, for my constituency in this community, the people that we love have been terrible. We've lost grocery stores, hospitals, um, and economic opportunities. I won't be a senator that allows a paper mill in a digital technology world to surprise me. I'm going to be a senator who's actively talking to the businesses of our community, recruiting. Pay attention to the fact that the chamber did not make an endorsement in this race. Pay attention to the fact that the business community has stood away from it. Not because they're scared of me, but because they have not seen what they wanted for our community out of economic development. I have been the person who started the conversations. Now I'm asking people to give me an opportunity to do the job. Thank you. Mm -hmm.